and welcome to the Napoleon Assist and the first in what will become a running feature on this podcast of review specials. Today I want to bring you a review of possibly the best book that I have ever read. Certainly it's a piece of historical scholarship, possibly the best book I've ever read full stop and it is this. Rory Muir's first volume of a two-part biography of the Duke of Wellington. Now, when I say this is the best book that I've ever read, that's not to cast any aspersions on the second one. It's just that uh, I'm going to focus specifically on this first volume today. The Duke of Wellington is alleged to have considered himself much exposed to authors. And as the bicentenaries of his victory passed, scholarly interest in the Duke remained so high that that was possibly even more true than ever. This book was the first of Rory's two-part biography of the Duke, which was highly anticipated, and boy, it did not disappoint. It was his first substantial solo monograph, actually, since his highly acclaimed study of the Battle of Salamanca, which was published way back in 2001. Rory suggests that the best work on Wellington rarely comes from biographies. If that's the case, which could perhaps be disputed, then this certainly breaks the mould, no questions about it. It comfortably outclasses any previous work on the Duke's life, not only in terms of depth of detail or precision, but also in terms of sheer class. It marks the culmination of 14 years of dedicated research, the depth of which frankly is apparent from the very first pages. Throughout Path to Victory, Rory carefully examines every element of the Duke's life, refusing to rely on the established legends that shroud almost every aspect of his existence. As a result, Rory discovers a number of often repeated anecdotes are actually untrue, and in the process makes some interesting new discoveries, not least about the details of Wellington's probable illegitimate son. He also constantly refutes this notion of Wellington's inevitable and meteoric rise to glory, something which is perhaps more common in some other works. Instead, Rory frequently highlights the changes in fortune that impinged upon Wellington's early career, whilst emphasising the importance of his very separate lives, um, both as a, a military commander, but also as a politician, which helped to secure his reputation in Westminster. This, Rory persuasively argues, I have to say, uh, was quite key in terms of ensuring that there were certain ministers who were willing to vouch for Wellington during the potentially ruinous inquiry into the Convention of Sintra following his first uh, foray into the Iberian Peninsula. It's that consideration of Wellington's military exploits within the context of his entire life that enables Rory to make some highly compelling and nuanced assessments of the factors that influence the Duke's career, um, perhaps more so than those who consider Wellington's military career within a, a vacuum. In arguing against that notion of Wellington's inevitable rise, Rory's work builds on some uh, wider efforts that were recently championed by Charles Esdell to change this popular perception that the Peninsula was an endless march to victory. This book will well, in fact, when it came out, it didn't provoke controversy per se, although there is perhaps a discussion to be had about just how far the concept of an intertwined, mutually beneficial political and military career can be taken. Wellington was by no means the only person to do that. And it would be interesting to see others explore whether what worked for Wellington actually worked for others during this period. Now, Rory is one of these people who never overtly engages in historiographical debate. He's not one of these who likes to lay into people. He is the epitome of a kind of scholar slash gentleman. And it's noticeable that said though, that his analysis does differ from the work of Hugh Davies, who in a study which came out just a short while before this did, entitled Wellington's Wars, The Makings of a Military Genius. That book made some Arguably controversial suggestions, not least uh, that Wellington was to a degree reckless, but by contrast, Rory suggests that events such as the assault on the, across the Douro in 1809, which resulted in the capture of Oporto, are not so much indicative of recklessness, but more a suggestion of decisiveness and boldness, where many generals would only have seen setbacks and issues. Now, that 
is enhanced, that, that is something that he enhances rather than detracts from Wellington's ability. And Rory is also very rigorous with his interrogation of primary evidence. And in the process, his reading contradicts um, the premise of a number of uh, the suggestions made by some, including Davies, um, about Wellington's alleged hysteria over the failure of his attack outside Seringapatam during his campaign in India. Muir is also very careful to fully consider the period between Wellington's campaigns in India and the Iberian Peninsula. Now that might seem something like something quite logical, but he has to reproach a, a, what is granted a tendency for many historians to skim over that period, partly because people kind of see the conflict bits as the entertainment, you know, the most interesting bits of the action. Now that approach admittedly is vital to Rory's wider thesis of how Wellington's military career was determined as much by merit as by personal connections. But having said all of that, Rory's considerations of Wellington's involvement in the Copenhagen uh, expedition and the resulting confidence expressed by George Murray and Robert Ansruter, the Adjutant General in Ireland, provide an interesting counterpoint to that enduringly popular finger of destiny argument that's in, advanced by individuals such as Richard Holmes. So in effect, his consideration of that, if you like, interwar period, okay, Wellington goes out to uh, Copenhagen for that expedition in 1806, but that the consideration of the period between India and the peninsula, essentially, is actually really enlightening and it's something that certainly more scholars should be doing. One of the most unique and valuable aspects of Rory's latest work is the downloadable commentary, which expands on one of the most successful features of Salamanca 1812, which was great for looking at issues of source material and, and wider issues connected to the study of the battle. At 700 pages, that document is actually almost as long as the book itself. I mean, the book is 720 odd pages. So it would have merited publication in its own right because it contains a valuable wealth of additional details and digressions, which themselves make for fascinating reading. As a result, the commentary alone ensures that this is an essential piece of work for any serious scholar of the peninsula because it contains so much deep and discriminating research into events contemporaneous to Wellington's life. Bizarrely, the size of this book might actually put some people off. You might be looking at it and thinking, well, look, 720 pages. Is this going to be easy reading? Is this going to be something that I want to invest the time in? Actually, you absolutely do. Rory has a knack, a rare knack, it has to be said, for providing very lucid explanations to subtly argued and meticulously researched points. And the prose is honestly an, an effortless read. It's extremely accessible and extremely enjoyable. The layout of the biography might actually draw criticism because this volume stops at 1814, as you may be able to see from the front cover there. Now, some might say, well, that's a cynical publicity ploy because obviously people will want to know about the Waterloo campaign. And people probably do draw comparisons with Elizabeth Longford's two volume biography because she split her study into Wellington, Years of the Sword and Wellington, Pillar of State. Um, to be honest, I don't think it's a cynical publication slash publicity ploy. I don't think it's something that's designed to make you buy the second volume. I think it's quite simply a question of length. Uh, having read volume two as well, I can tell you that there's another 100, 150 pages covering Waterloo and the wider campaign. So to tack that onto a book that's already that thick would probably have just made the whole thing unwieldy. Um, and so as a result, I think it's one of those things that's required for balance. The extensive attention that Roy pays to the Peninsula War might also surprise some people. I mean, it's about two thirds of the book. It's pretty much that if you're watching this on YouTube, it's, it's a large portion of it. Um, to, and this is devoted, devoted to a conflict that lasted, let's bear in mind, six years. So some might say, well, is the, the balance skewed? I think there are a couple of things that are worth bearing in mind there. First, that Rory's assessment of Wellington's career pre-Peninsula War is by no means insubstantial. It's 233 pages. Now, a lot of biographies 
won't actually run to 233 pages. So it far, out, uh, far exceeds the efforts of other biographers. Equally, considering the importance of the Peninsula War in establishing Wellington's reputation, which then provided the foundation for his later career, I would say that the concentration on that conflict is justifiable. So, Wellington Path to Victory. It's superbly written. It surpasses any previous work on the Duke's life in terms of depth of research and makes, and that in itself makes it a vitally important book for scholars of the period. You can download the commentary for free online, but seriously, invest in this. This is one of the standout studies of this period. The most famous and most enduring work is probably that of Sir Charles Oman. This, Wellington, the Path of Victory, is on a par with it. That's it for this reviews episode. A quick disclaimer from me, I'm not sponsored by any publishing companies and I don't receive any money from the publishers to review this or any of the other books that I feature. My opinions are quite simply my own, but I do have a rule that if I can't be positive about a book, I don't go public with my reviews. I'm not in the business of tearing people down. For that reason though, I don't take requests from authors to review their books for this podcast. Thank you to everyone who takes the time to like, share and retweet. Please do leave a review and follow via your preferred podcast platform. And if you're watching on YouTube, please do hit that subscribe button. It all helps to spread the word. I also want to take a moment to thank those of you who are showing incredible generosity by digging into your pockets to support this podcast on Patreon. If you aren't already a patron and are interested, there is a link in the description below. And patrons do get some neat little perks like having their names featured in the credits and being able to influence some of the future content. Tiers start from one pound and up, one pound a month, which is still a big ask, I know, but it helps to cover some of the overheads from production and in time should help me to increase the amount of content that I produce. I therefore make no apologies for giving a shout out to my patrons who at the time of recording were Rob Griffith, Alex Churchill, Frida Seddon, Brendan Teeling, John Haynes, Anna Vakulenko, Beatrice de Graaf and Lynn Dawson. Until next time, I'm Zach White. This has been The Napoleon Assist. Take care, my friends. Stay well, stay safe. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you.